Right now, you are about to really get to know Skip Bayless. He opens up about his childhood, family, his famous brother, Rick, and how he made it through some of the struggles in his life. Let's go. What was your first job as a teenager? I'm going to assume. I was forced to work in my father's little hole-in-the-wall barbecue joint on the south side of Oklahoma City from the time I was probably four years old until I graduated from high school, and I despised every second of it. I had no aptitude for cooking. My brother used that restaurant as a springboard to become one of the best chefs in America, but I hated it to the point that I... I didn't know what to do, so I I was forced to clean off tables during the lunch rush and sweep out what they call the bullpen where all the trash cans were. And in the morning, I did some what they called prep work. This is back in the days before, you know, Cuisinart's or whatever, where I actually had to take the butcher knife and chop up green peppers into little pieces for the potato salad. And it all basically ended the day I nearly cut this finger off with a butcher knife on a wet green pepper that I was not paying much attention to. So that it taught me a lot about perseverance and dedication to a crappy job for, for which I got paid like a quarter an hour or whatever. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So but your brother, it yes. took... My brother went on to become a very famous chef in Chicago. Um, He owns a number of restaurants, one of which called the Topolabampo Room is Obama's favorite restaurant. And I believe my brother was asked to be the White House chef by Obama during his first term, but my brother couldn't do it because he had too many restaurant responsibilities in his little restaurant empire. But I'm um, very proud of him. But he, u- he used to cook with my father, and I didn't care about cooking. And to this day, I can't boil water in a microwave. So was that a little bit of a stressor between you and your father? Everything was a stressor between me and my father. We did not click. We clashed from the start. And the only silver lining was he drove me... Um, without trying he drove me to become what I am today that it was all sort of in spite of my father that is so interesting I can't believe we didn't get into that on the whole podcast that well, what we could have gone into we could for keep going if you want a half open. hour yep we probably could have that's so interesting so mm-hmm. you already figured that out a long time ago this isn't a new revelation for you no but uh, you can't choose your parents but the irony of this whole situation was my parents made me me, not by choice. They just sort of accidentally made me me. But I was the oldest, and my my mom didn't want kids. She had three kids for her mom, and she lived in fear of her mom and lived for her mom's approval. So she didn't even want to be a mother and that's really hard on the oldest child because the then the oldest child has to experience everything on his own he has to figure it out on the fly and at least the second and third kids have some sort of blueprint of oh well this is how he did it so maybe we should try that that works instead of that and yet my mother had huge charisma she was incredibly egotistical but but in her own good way where she took over every room she walked into and I got her nature I I light up for the camera the way she lit up for for every room she walked into so I got that from my mom and, and I learned discipline and drive from my father his was channeled the wrong way and he fell to the bottom of the bottle and then my mother did too they were both Um, dangerously drunk most of the time and my mother saved herself by dragging herself to AA and um, she stayed sober the last 30 years of her life and my father drank himself to death when he was 49 years of age and died of cirrhosis of the liver where his liver just finally failed but I, I couldn't have picked two better parents to propel me to where I got so, it was the right so I look at it as a you. blessing yeah in a yeah weird way, but it was a hard childhood no fun they were they were drunk most of the time 
when you were growing up, like all the years? My father was what they called a functional alcoholic, and my lingering memories are as soon as he got up, he made himself a drink of vodka and orange juice, and the last thing he would drive home, I would be working at the restaurant, this is when I was like six, seven years old, the, the barbecue joint called the Hickory House, and he would make himself a vodka and Coke for the drive home in the days of no seat belts and, and like, I don't know how we survived, but he could function okay behind the wheel while right. just a little bit drunk, but always drunk. My mother was more of a fall down drunk. And yet my earliest memories of the parties they threw were, and this is another blessing, my father as, as like a party trick me being the oldest at three, four years old would, would ask me to sip his mixed drink, wh whatever it was. And of course I would do the bitter beer face of, you know, like that's terrible. And everybody would laugh uh -huh. and, and it was truly awful to me. It was incredibly sour and, and disgusting. It was like worse than the worst cough medicine or castor oil that you could take. And so it saved me because the, the psychotherapist I had to go to for both my parents as they tried to beat their alcohol addiction would always say, you, you better be careful because you're genetically, you're double genetically predisposed to alcoholism because you're just like they are. You got all their genes and, and their same sort of drive and, and issues. And so I didn't drink. And I, when I was 14, the first therapist asked me first, that we had three kids, but I was the oldest, do you drink alcohol? Nope. Will you? Nope. Got no use for it. It was foul to me. So, so my father inadvertently saved me from myself by feeding me bitter alcohol to make all of their friends laugh. So thank you dad for that one because I was the only one in my right mind and I could see how silly they all looked and it always horrified me how alcohol completely changed my mother into someone I did not know and I would say who is this person because she could have th three sips and all of a sudden she's slurring her speech and acting a fool like that's my mother what's wrong with her and I thought that stuff is potent because that turns you into somebody else. And I don't know if that's who she wanted to become, but she couldn't handle her alcohol at all. And then later in my high school and college years, she would embarrass me at any function. A couple of times, one time we had, I, I tried to have a New Year's party in college at my house and she tried to serve us some little snacks and she's dropping the tray on the floor because she was just, falling down drunk and I was ashamed of her and embarrassed for my friends that they had to watch her because they sort of had grown up with her and knew her as somebody else so I learned a lot about the evils of alcohol if you can't I mean obviously a lot of people are okay in moderation but um, I just knew that even though I was about to enter a profession of sports writing, newspaper sports writing, known for alcohol consumption, that I couldn't. And it made, early on, a lot of my cohorts, my coworkers, a little nervous because they'd, you know, guys just for camaraderie after work at the L.A. Times, they would ask me, we're all going out for a, a pop, they might say, you know, post uh, work at the local bar downtown LA. Well, I'm happy to go if I can sip a Diet Coke, but that made them uncomfortable because I'd be the only one in my right mind and maybe that would be a bad thing. Maybe they couldn't let their hair down, so to speak, around me. So it made it a little uncomfortable early in my career. But as time went on, everybody got a little healthier sort of mentally and physically and that didn't that wasn't such an issue anymore in my 
my mid years in sports writing as I segued into TV. I think mm. a lot of people were enlightened about the evils of strong drink. So it was the right timing. It, it, it was. was just the you were on the tail end of mm -hmm. that because otherwise it could have really derailed things for you. It would have. Yeah. Because I'm completely obsessive compulsive. So whatever I do, I do it a thousand miles an hour. And if I started drinking, I would probably drink a thousand miles an hour. And you know, and I know where that would lead. Yeah. So you don't pick up a drink ever? Ever. Have you ever? I tried once. I married my high school sweetheart, which was a mistake, but I still love her. You know, like she's still, she's like my sister. But when I first got to the LA Times, she said, you know, maybe you need to ingratiate yourself a little more. Maybe, maybe you need to show them that you'll try a little bit. So she said, I'm going to buy a bottle of wine and I want you to just try sipping wine and see if you can handle, not, not to handle the alcohol, but handle the taste. Let's try red or white. Let's see which one you could sip. And so I did and I decided I can barely tolerate red wine. So this is a true, quick, funny story. I would go out occasionally with people and I would get one glass and maybe sip, sip it twice just to, to demonstrate to the table. I'm, I'm joining in here, but I really despised it and I had no use for it and it didn't do anything to me. But I covered the great Joe Namath. I don't know if you remember Joe Namath. Of course. Okay. Even I know Joe okay. Namath. Well, then good. Everybody knows Joe Namath. Plus I he was on the Brady Bunch. At the end of his, what's that? Plus, he was on the Brady Bunch. Oh God, he was. Yeah, well, that's, that really he came qualifies him as so, a star. Yeah. You know, she loves the Brady. Ernestine loves the Brady Same. Bunch. You should have talked about. I that. had Peter Brady on the show last year. Wow, that I'll is huge. Later. She knows all the trivia, yeah. all the details, every episode, the football in the face episode. Yes. She knows oh my nose. <laughs> a little bond okay. over that. I don't know it that that well. Okay, so Joe Namath. Joe Namath came to the Rams at the very end of his career, and he was a shell of himself because his knees were a wreck, but the owner of the Rams named Carol Rosenblum just wanted a gate attraction. I've got Joe Namath for his final year. And I clicked with Joe, and he liked me and didn't like many of the other, or maybe any of the other reporters. So they lost this sort of ignominious ugly playoff game in the rain to the Minnesota Vikings here at the Coliseum and it was the end of Joe Namath but we weren't sure if he was going to go somewhere else and try another year so on the Monday after the loss I went out to the practice field and I happened to catch him in his locker and nobody else was around and I said hey what's up and he was he had a a duffel bag and he was filling it with all the contents of his locker and he said I'm done I said you're, you're completely done? Yep. I said, could I write that? Yep, if you want to. I said, would you talk to me about it? Not now, but I will later if you'll meet me at so-and-so. And it was this what they used to call a Southern California fern bar, like sort of an upscale bar in Long Beach where their practice field was. So I had to wait a couple of hours. I went there, and this was in my little red wine period. So I walk in and I'm stunned to find they've pushed all the tables together in the middle and he's got all these friends I did not know, like from his apartment complex. I don't know who they were. And they were having a retirement bash with maybe 20 people around tables. So I sat next to Joe. Now I got to try to interview him in the middle of a bash, which is, as you would know, I know. Not, not the best. So what are you drinking? I said, absent my uh, red wine now in those days they are holding the paper for me because i've told them i got the joe namath retirement story this is the los angeles times they're going to put it Huge. on wh what we used to call 1a as in the front page of the paper not and just the sports the not front the sports page, yeah. the front across the top because he was a big deal he was obviously a big deal to the jets and won the super bowl and held his finger up after he guaranteed the victory but he was a big deal in LA because he was Hollywood he was a movie star as well as a football star so I'm sitting next to Joe what are you drinking red wine so the server brings me red wine plops one down and I start to nervously sip the red wine with no real plan and I'm trying to ask him questions and I'm trying to jot notes and it's it's just crazed and I'm looking at my watch I'm not gonna make the deadline I'm not gonna make it uh, she comes by again and plops down a second red wine, and I sipped to the bottom of two red wines, 
True story. I said, Joe, I got to run. He said, great. Do you have what you need? I said, I think so. And he said, well, I've, I've enjoyed working with you, blah, blah, blah. I said, I got to go. And I got up to leave. And I took one step. And I fell into the table behind us. If you like our talk, please tap that like button. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe for more intimate talks with your favorite celebs.